Hello everybody, uh, welcome to our next St Peter's video. For those who don't know me, my name is Andrew and I'm Vicky here at St Peter's and uh, welcome to our Monday Thursday celebration. As I'm sure you remember, Monday Thursday is the day when we recall the last time that Jesus shared the Passover feast with his disciples. It was here that Jesus washed his disciples' feet. Here that Jesus broke bread and shared wine, a prelude to a prefiguring of his own body being broken and his own blood outpoured upon the cross. And we will celebrate all of this today in this little video. So here's what we're going to do. First, we'll explore the experience of having your feet washed by Jesus, seeing it as through Peter's eyes. And then if you're able, I'd like you to, I'd like you to actually really wash each other's feet. You'll need a basin or two, some warmish water, a bit of soap and a towel, so if you've not got these ready and you'd like to join in, perhaps you'd like to pause me now, pause this little video and uh, go and get them, okay? Okay, are we back? Wonderful. So, Passover. As I'm sure you will all know, Passover was and still is today possibly the most important, certainly the most celebrated day in the whole Jewish calendar. It was, is the day when the Jewish people celebrate their flight from the Egyptians, how they were delivered from slavery to freedom, and how they became a nation in their own right. So just think of Christmas Day, St George's Day, a full-on family celebration and a holiday all rolled into one. A day of identity, a day full of excitement and full of music and celebration, but most of all full of food like most wonderful celebrations. And for Jesus and his disciples too, like every other Jew for that matter, Passover would have been the highlight of their year. It would have been what they'd been looking forward to all year. But this year was different. Remember, we've just had Palm Sunday, that triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem as King, as Messiah. And so there was, there, there was an ex heightened sense of expectation of anticipation in the air. Maybe this was the year? The year when they were finally going to get their freedom? When the Romans would be overthrown? Where the Jewish people would become a victorious nation again? Maybe it would be this weekend, this weekend, when all would change, when empires would tumble, when history would be made. So now let's listen. Let's listen as we imagine how the disciple Peter might have recounted this experience of Passover on that fateful year in this retelling of John chapter 13. The room is getting dark, the lamps are lit, casting flickering shadows over the walls. The air is mild, not hot, just mild. It smells of lamb and herbs with the pungent aroma of herbs overshadowing even the lamb. Bitterness, slavery. From far away, the sounds of music floating through open windows, the sounds of others feasting. To have our own feast and yet to be part of a greater feast. That's a good feeling. There is an air of expectation in the room. We've seen the impossible these last couple of weeks. Ever since I said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. The miracles were dizzying in their sheer impossibility. There are many who claim to heal the sick and some prophets who raise the dead, but now? Now we're seeing a shaking of the bounds of reality itself. A man born blind, seeing for the first time. A dead man rotting in his grave, coming to life again and eating with us. Now must be the time of the new kingdom to come. The Passover, the celebration of our passing from slavery of Egypt to freedom. What better time could there be to begin again? To set us free, the Roman slaves free. A totally new political state will appear on the map, one of freedom and love. The state our people have been waiting for for so long. A king like David, only better. A good ruler like David, but this time the son of God. Our Christ will take the throne. He'll throw out the Romans and all will be well. And for us? Well, I suppose we'll be ambassadors of some sort or ministers in this new government. But despite all this headiness, all this excitement, 
I feel tired too. We queued all afternoon to get our lambs slain by the priests. There are a lot of lambs to sacrifice in a city this side, size. Don and I took a few hours to roast it, but now it's ready. Everything is ready. The lamb, the herbs, the unleavened bread, the couches to recline on. We sit at the meal and Jesus takes his place in the center and we begin to eat. I wonder if my expectation is catching, if there is something in the air. I'm not the only one talking about thrones and new political world order. What are we going to change first? We're setting up a new government, sir. Who's going to get the best job? And then Jesus stops abruptly and he puts down his cup of wine. Suddenly he gets it from the table, strips off his outer clothing, and he takes a soft woolen towel from the hook and wraps it around his waist. Then he grabs a basin and a water jug from near the door. His actions are slow, deliberate, thoughtful. He goes to where Andrew is sitting first at the end of the table and he begins to wash his feet. What on earth is going on? Foot washing is a, a normal thing in our culture, but it's usually done by the servant if there is one or by one of us. You see, we're dusty, our feet powdered with grey and white sand blown in from the desert and it's sticky with sweat. Our Christ shouldn't do it. He's our honoured guest. He's the new Messiah. Kings don't wash their own feet. <laughs> Never mind anybody else's. So how do I feel? Well, shocked and also a little sick. Like something's not quite going according to plan. For a minute or two, I can only watch open mouth, disgusted almost. Now he's washing Philip's feet. And I watch the way that Jesus touches his feet tenderly. It reminds me of my mother and the way that she would bathe the baby. It's not the way a slave washes a foot, quickly, mechanically, with professional efficiency. This is something altogether more tender. And then he reaches me. And I know I've got to say something. Master, are you going to wash my feet? He looks up at me. And staring into my eyes, it's as if he's looking into my very soul. You do not realise what I'm doing but later you will understand. But this is too much. I stand up and move away from the bowl. No, I say, you should never wash my feet. Jesus answers slowly, unless I wash you, you can have no part with me. These are hard words. They sting me like a slap in the face because, because I want to be part of this so badly We've been through such a difficult journey together and I want to be there at the climax. I care about him so much. And if that is the price I have to pay to be part of it, then so be it. So I say, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And to this Jesus says, a person who's had a bath needs only to wash his feet and his body is clean and you are clean, though not every one of you. I understand the first part at least. I don't understand the second part of what he's saying. His voice has become hard and slightly choked. There's something going on, some subtext between him and someone else in the room that I don't understand. The moment passes, however, and Jesus places my feet in the water. His touch feels strange. I sense the power in his fingers. I know that he can raise the dead, and yet he's kneeling before me. The world sways slightly. This feels a little unreal. And then he dries my feet. And there is somehow a finality in that drying, like it's the end of an era. He finishes washing the others. And then he puts his clothes back on and returns to his place at the table as if nothing out of the ordinary has happened. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asks, looking at each of us in turn. You call me teacher and Lord and rightly so, for this is what I am. Now if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. And that was it.
suddenly I understood like lightning piercing my soul we rule by serving that is our way not the way of politicians or of generals or great armies who crush those under them we do what needs to be done whether it by cleaning feet or kissing lepers walking miles or singing psalms we rule by serving we rule by serving this is how we are to live our lives now this is who we are we say we are followers of Jesus we're servants is this what we do how do you and I live our lives would that title servant describe it so let's just take a moment to reflect upon this shall we a servant serves not out of self-interest or self-advancement nor for thanks and not necessarily because it's what they want to do it's simply their role and Jesus says clearly today that if you are a disciple of mine this is what your life will look like this is how your life should be shaped so if you're able here's where we do the foot washy thing so perhaps you want to pause this video take off your socks and shoes pour out the water into a bowl and go for it remembering that you'll need a towel okay just pause me now for a minute please okay welcome back everyone for those of you who are able to either wash or have your feet washed how are you feeling now well this act of washing and cleansing provides the ideal context for a prayer of confession. So let's have this now, shall we? You asked for my hands that you might use them for your purpose. I gave them for a moment, then withdrew them, for the work was hard. You asked for my mouth to speak out against injustice. I gave you a whisper that I might not be accused. You asked for my eyes to see the pain of poverty. I closed them for I did not want to see. You asked for my life that you might work through me. I gave you a small part that I might not get too involved. Oh Lord, forgive my calculated efforts to serve you only when it's convenient for me to do so, only in places where it is safe to do so and only with those who make it easy to do so. Father, forgive me, renew me, send me out as a usable instrument that I might take seriously the meaning of your cross. Amen. Our Monday Thursday service is drawing to a close, but before we go, we're gonna to sing together, or rather I'm gonna sing and I'm going to hope and pray that you join in with me. It's a hymn of thanks and gratefulness. We're going to sing the first verse of Amazing Grace. I was trying to think of a hymn that we would all know. So let's sing this a beautiful hymn, the first verse of this beautiful hymn together, and we'll do it twice. It goes, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. This ends our celebration of Monday Thursday. I pray that you've been enriched and encouraged. And so, I'm going to see you next, hopefully, on Good Friday. So I will see you then. 
God bless everyone. Bye-bye.